Hi everyone, I'm Ali Standing, a lecturer in contextual studies at Birmingham City University School of Visual Communication. I'm really excited to be sharing some insights with you through this short presentation as part of Valencia Design Educators Forum 2020. I'm going to be talking about psychogeography, a topic of real interest to me and specifically how some of its playful techniques can be employed as part of the learning experience. The theme of this forum, as you know, is analogue and digital, and despite psychogeography being closely associated with moving through physical space, the digital world does in fact offer a number of exciting possibilities in terms of expanding and enhancing this exploration. In this presentation, I'm going to touch upon a few things. Firstly, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, I'm going to define psychogeography and give a bit of historical context surrounding it. I'm also going to look at the derive and the subversive use and creation of maps, both well-known psychogeographic techniques. I'm going to mention a few instances in which I've explored these within teaching activities. And I'm also going to consider various ways in which these physical activities can be translated into the virtual realm. Though it has a history stretching back much further, which sadly I don't have time to mention today, the word psychogeography itself was coined in 1955 by Guy Debord, a Marxist cultural theorist, artist and activist. He was founding member of two groups, the Lettrist International and later the Situationist International. These groups hoped to use psychogeography as a means to break down barriers between culture and everyday life, and to revolutionise approaches to navigating urban space. Debord's definition of psychogeography was the study of the precise laws and specific effects of the geographical environment, consciously organised or not, on the emotions and behaviour of individuals. If that doesn't make much sense to you, then don't worry. This much reproduced definition is admittedly a rather stuffy one, and one which doesn't serve to capture the playful nature of the diverse and multidisciplinary work which has come out of this area since then. Perhaps a simpler way of understanding the term is that, as its name suggests, it is the intersection of psychology and geography, or more simply still, how places feel. One of the beauties of psychogeography is that it does, as Debord noted, have a pleasing vagueness. Those who practice it are free to define it for themselves. In his 2004 article, A New Way of Walking, Joseph Hart describes it as a whole toy box full of playful, inventive strategies for exploring cities, a definition I personally much prefer. This ludic nature of psychogeography to which Hart refers is key. Indeed, the Lettrist International's magazine Potlatch included a psychogeographic game of the week, and many of the techniques employed by psychogeographers since then are inherently playful. The derive, which is French for drift, was initially proposed in 1956 by Guy Debord, and it was explained in the theory of the derive as a walk through an urban environment, one which was playful, critical, and quite different from the classic notions of a journey or stroll. As Sadie Plant notes in The Most Radical Gesture, this type of walk involved seeking out reasons for movement other than those for which an environment was designed. The aim of drifting in this way was to provoke a deeper understanding of the city, and as such constituted a challenge to dominant forms of behaviour, life and experience. Play was, and remains, central to the concept of the derive. These journeys often use a game of sorts as a way of relinquishing control over direction. Many of these games involve the subversive use of maps. In Merlin Coverley's useful pocket guide to the topic, Robert McFarlane suggests drawing a circle on a map and attempting to follow that line, challenging the reader to catch the textual runoff of the streets, the graffiti, the branded litter, the snatches of conversation. And he highlights the importance of recording these journeys in the stroller's favoured medium. He mentions photography, sound recording and writing, but we could add any number of diverse possibilities to this list. Psychogeography as a practice is inherently inter- and transdisciplinary, meaning it's ideal to incorporate into cross-disciplinary collaborative modules, especially those with a creative output. 
Narrative Space and Place is a 20 credit level 4 module I helped colleagues to develop in 2018, which involves students working in small groups towards the collaborative creation of a lo-fi experimental publication or zine. The visual and textual material for the publications was generated by each student group, who at the very start of the module were tasked with carrying out a derive of their own. This image is an illustration by Molly Rycroft Stanley, a student who undertook the module last year. After first being introduced to the idea of psychogeography, and more specifically the derive, students used a range of playful methods to determine their roots. While attempts can be made to plan, this is often futile. Molly told me that even though she and her partner had tried to follow the circle they'd drawn on a map, they ended up following their noses instead. For Molly, the element of chance offered by this technique was refreshing. She told me that the derive allowed her to change her standard method, saying, As someone who usually likes to plan every little detail, it was nice to take a break from this approach and adopt a more free style of research. Essentially, the purpose of any psychogeographic game is to relinquish control over direction, with the goal of uncovering something unexpected in the urban environment. In various workshops, I've asked students to suggest psychogeographic games of their own before setting out into the city. Interesting ideas, all of which we've tried out some more successfully than others, include whimsical suggestions such as taking every left turn, following a bird, or walking in search of a certain letter in the alphabet. Shown here is a route decider made by a group of students at Asada in Granada, where I delivered a psychogeography workshop earlier this year. The theme of this forum is analogue and digital, so it's important to consider how something so closely associated with the physical exploration of space might function in a digital realm. This is a question which has been asked by researchers since the early days of the internet in the 1990s, with many highlighting interesting parallels between ideas such as the derive and the act of exploring cyberspace itself. Let's look for a moment at this 1955 passage in which Guy Debord explains how, in a derive, one or more persons, during a certain period, drop their usual motives for movement and action, their relations, their work and leisure activities, and let themselves be drawn by the attractions of the terrain and the encounters they find there. Does that not sound to you at least a bit like surfing the net, where one bit of content links to the next and on and on, but somehow always back to a cat video? With our networked devices and the collection of geospatial data, digital technologies can augment our experience of the city creating another type of map which is superimposed on top of the physical space. This is an idea I explored with a group of students in a workshop carried out as part of Studio Lab at Flatpak Festival in 2017. Here, students drifted through virtual space by following a chain of Instagram hashtags, working on the production of a large-scale illustrated map which incorporated text, image and projections. According to a 2018 article from UAL's Creative Teaching and Learning Journal, when employing psychogeography as a potential pedagogic approach in higher education, it's crucial to design the learning spaces in a way that encourages curiosity. Here, it's important to note that learning spaces can function on a number of levels, physical, mental and virtual, and that in the context of psychogeography, the city itself is indeed a learning space. Collaborative practice is an ambitious and innovative cross-faculty level 5 module I've helped to develop over the last few years. Part of the pre-module reference material provided to students is a collaborative soundscape. Recorded narrations of walks taken by staff from across the faculty and focused on diverse topics from text in the city to the birthplace of British techno and many in between. In listening to these recordings, students can begin to see that the city is not a unified whole but a unity of fragmented perceptions. 
In the aforementioned article, it's noted that learning spaces cultivated should challenge the hierarchy of lecturer-student relations. This collaborative soundscape certainly represents such a hierarchical disruption in that through virtually walking with students, the lecturer too is engaging in a learning journey of their own, opening themselves up to the possibilities of new experiences as they come upon the shifting ambiences and encounters of the urban space they move through. As mentioned previously, the subversive use and creation of maps is something which has been key to psychogeography since its inception. Through a process of recording his drifts through the city of Paris, Guy Debord made a series of maps in the 1950s. These highly personal works did not function as a regular map. Rather, they took as their starting point a subjective perspective using a range of media and artistic techniques to represent the spatial experience of Debord himself, serving to emphasise that urban space is a collection of individual experiences. Debord himself saw the production of these maps as transformative, claiming that it could lead to complete insubordination to habitual influences. Since then, many psychogeographers and other creative practitioners have explored the potential of playful cartography, and it's something I've used within my own teaching practice on a number of occasions. Karen O'Rourke, author of Walking and Mapping Artists as Cartographers, asserts that mapping, like walking, is an embodied experience carried out from a particular point of view. This becomes very clear when carrying out creative mapping tasks. There's such a variety of subjective outcomes when students are tasked with finding an alternative way of mapping or simply of drawing a map of where they live. It would seem that a creative mapping activity might be an ideal one to encourage the type of critical thought demanded at HE level playing with students' preconceived ideas and concepts, requiring them to develop their own perspective and to understand the multiplicity of alternative views. Playful approaches like these sit within a framework of constructivist educational theory, which, put simply, is based around the idea that students construct their own perspective of the world based on their interpretation of their personal experiences. Creative mapping could, then, help students to transition from a learning process of direct transmission to one which is more constructive. Mapping in a less geographical sense can also be relevant within the context of curriculum design, as suggested by Arthur Effland, who compares learning design to that of urban space calling for a curriculum which represents the unplanned or natural city and the complexity of interdisciplinary and overlapping academic topics. He demonstrates his ideas using diagrams he calls semi-lattices, which are essentially conceptual maps broken down into subtopics and which demonstrate contextual overlaps. While these conceptual maps can indeed be used as a learning design tool, they can also be employed as a teaching activity. By asking a student to map their research question and its associated thematic subtopics, it's possible to allow for a more complex and flexible learning structure, which facilitates connections between knowledge zones, which is, of course, key to the development of critical thinking skills. In terms of testing this kind of activity in a digital space, collaborative note-taking software could indeed be useful. So what tools are out there which might help to facilitate a wholly digital psychogeography? Now this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I'd like to suggest a few that I've tried. In the background of this slide, you can see a recording made on mapcrunch.com a website which, at the click of a button, drops the viewer at a random spot on Google Earth. So it's perfect for exploration in isolation. Google Earth itself has some interesting possibilities too, such as being able to click view historical imagery and essentially go back in time. Derive app 
is an application which gives the user a series of prompts to follow to facilitate their own urban drift. It's a great idea in theory, but in practice it doesn't always work out quite so well. Story Maps by ArcGIS is a web-based platform for combining maps with narrative text, images and multimedia content. Another platform which can be useful in the creation of exploratory non-linear narratives, which in their own way work as a type of map, is the open source tool Twine. The introduction of psychogeographic games into the learning experience is something that has the potential to be transformative for students on a number of levels. Not only does it alter their perception of the city and of their place within the wider cultural landscape, it can also help them to see how their own individual experience fits into a plurality of perspectives. This is key in terms of helping students to adapt to a more constructive form of learning and to cultivate the kind of critical thought demanded at HE level. These playful psychogeographic practices, which can span a multitude of disciplines, are especially relevant within a creative sector which is placing increasing amounts of importance on the idea of interdisciplinary working, both in education and within industry. Through a deeper and more playful engagement, both with the city and with the idea of mapping, it's possible to open up transitional spaces for observation, imagination and narration. In asking students to look at, move through and map the city, either physically or virtually, we can bring about in them an ontological shift, helping them to understand the layered and interconnected nature of complex issues to tolerate uncertainties and possibilities, and ultimately to see and articulate their own position in relation to them. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I really hope you found it to be thought-provoking in some way. If you'd like to know more about these ideas or are interested in networking, I'd love to talk. It's Ali Standing on Instagram or on LinkedIn or you can email me at alexandra.standing at bcu.ac.uk. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks.